My name is Bill Reynolds. I've been working with the Healthcare Power of Attorney for the state of North Carolina. I was working with Gray down there with uh, North Carolina Legal Aid and with the class here. Um, I think the, the easiest way to get into what a healthcare power of attorney is is to kind of look at where it came from and where it was born from. Um, through the 70s and 80s, there became this, and even into the 90s, there became uh, a few couple uh, or a few um, significant public cases where there were young people that had become essentially brain dead, and the families had fought hospitals, or sometimes the families had fought with it, within each other on when they can take that person off of life support. Life support either consisted of artificial nutrition, artificial nutrition, a feeding tube, or a respirator. Um, the first case, Henry Quinlan, was Karen Ann Quinlan from New Jersey. Um, within day after, she was, she went to a party. She had ingested drugs and alcohol. Uh, they had found her unresponsive, and between the time that she became unresponsive, she well, she wasn't breathing. Um, the time the time that she found her when she got in the hospital, she had uh, suffered significant brain trauma to the point where she was brain dead. Um, and this was in 1976. Although she, her mother later said that although she was portrayed as a sleeping beauty, she was thrash in the bed. Um, she was hooked up to all kinds of machines. Her body would uh, subconsciously fight treatments and that kind of thing. It was a really brutal thing for the whole family to go through. So the family petitioned the hospital to take her off of life support. Um, when they did that, the doctors refused, saying that she didn't meet the clinical symptoms for being brain dead. Uh, and because of that, they would be charged for homicide. And the New Jersey State Legislature, or the New Jersey um, Department of Justice intervened when the case became public. The, the parents went, you know, they, they were talking about their plight and how there wasn't anything they could do about their daughter. And they said that they would prosecute any doctor that came, that tried to uh, end her life. On appeal, the New Jersey Supreme Court allowed the removal of Karen's respirator. Uh, and they stated in their opinion that no compelling interest of the state could compel Karen to endure the unendurable, which is what she was going through. Her body was alive, but her mind was dead and there was no reason for her to still be alive. And then a side note, they actually, when the, the state Supreme Court took her off of life support, they took her off a respirator, she ended up living for another 11 years. Just, she, uh, her body regained the ability to at least breathe on its own, keep itself alive, and she, she ended up living until about 1990. The second case, which is the case that reached the Supreme Court, was Nancy Cruzan in Missouri. Um, Nancy Cruzan was in a severe, was in a car accident, was in a permanent, permanent vegetative state as of 19, 1983. Within a few years, her parents were also petitioning the hospital, and the, the same thing happened. It went up to the uh, Missouri State Supreme Court, and they said that you cannot take her off of life support. It would be a violation of her, uh, of her uh, rights. Her parents had stated that when Nancy was alive, now she was 25 years old, so these things don't really cross our minds, but when she was alive, she had stated that she didn't want to live like that. She would have wanted to be taken off of life support. But these were only verbal uh, verbal assertions and you know there was no nothing real, really there. Um, after the Missouri after the Missouri State Supreme Court found against the parents they petitioned the Supreme Court and in a five to four decision they issued two holdings which are really key to this. Um, the first was that the right of a competent individual to refuse medical treatment is constitutionally protected liberty interest. Therefore if Nancy had said and put in writing beforehand, take me off of a, a respirator, take me off of a feeding tube, they could have done that, and it was within her right. And there, a state law can't trump that. However, because she didn't, and because she had only said these things verbally, she didn't have the standing to do that, and her parents couldn't take her off life support. There's another key case after this. Um, this is kind of where it goes into. There's another case through the 90s that's uh, more popular, or was uh, more public since then, was just Terry Shiva. Terry Shiva was a similar situation, except it was a fight between her parents and her husband. Her husband wanted to take, she was permanent, in a permanent vegetative state. Her husband wanted to take her off of life support, and her parents wanted to keep her on, and it became a really contentious fight in the state of Florida, to the point where, I mean, everyone was intervening. They were taking, documenting her. They took videos of her, which supported her, purportedly said that she was, she had like minimal level brain function, she wasn't brain dead. This and that, and uh, it's become something very contentious, especially when you're looking at it, you know, fighting between a, a family, a family that's already grieving, someone that's technically dead, um, someone that'll never survive or, you know, recover. And uh, in, the, in the Cruzan case, they said that she would have lived for another 30 years. So you start to take, think about health costs and all this kind of thing. So after that Supreme Court case came down in about 1990, um, 1991, 1992, sweeping, uh, states started to enact these 
health care power of attorney laws. And it allowed for um, state law to say you can direct what you can and can't happen to you if you can't make decisions. And North Carolina did this in 1991. The statute created a non-exclusive method for an individual to exercise his or her right to give, withhold, withdraw, or consent to medical treatment, including mental health treatment, which is a big one, when the individual lacks sufficient understanding or capacity to make or communicate a health care decision. Now, to fall in line with the Cruzan decision, you have to put this in a strict statutory form. Um, the way North Carolina did it to begin with was just the statute, and it wasn't the short form incorporated with it. They, in 2007, they amended the statute and, and included the statutory short form, which I referenced later, and we built the A to J off of. Um, it's important because, I mean, obviously, if you're in this state, you can't express your desire. And the way that the Supreme Court has held it, if you can't, or if there's any ambiguities in it, if there's no written um, proof, they're going to exercise best judgment over you without your consent. So, and best judgment is going to keep you alive until you die of natural causes. Um, so going from there, this is the short form. There are portions of the short form, and I'll show the whole thing later. But it is... It's a simple form, and it's a little bit different. It's not necessarily pulling out information, although it's very important, but it's it becomes more important to make sure that it fits all the statutory guidelines. Um, there's a couple things that you know, pre uh, prerequisites that people have to fit to make it work, and it can't contradict itself, because if it does, the court's going to jump in and they're going to say, well, it's not clear, and we're not going to exercise it. Um, and a lot of it happens with um, if you if you say different things, or if you uh, have filled out subsequent forms, you've filled out the separate forms that talk about different things, um, including events directives, which are specific. You are saying a lot of times you go into, when you go into a hospital uh, and you're going to have surgery, this is what I want to happen if this thing happens. Um, it's not necessarily this is, and the healthcare power of attorney gets uh, it, it's not really something that you're looking at as an inevitable. It's not. It's more like. If I become sick, if I become injured, and then it triggers. And when it triggers, it's going to allow someone to make healthcare decisions for you based on some restrictions if you want them. Um, the form is short, but like I said, it's a lot of, I mean, it's just a lot of understanding. So the A to J interview that, that I created with the help of North Carolina Legal Aid was explaining exactly what you're signing and explaining exactly who, really who you want, you know, or guiding someone who you want to make these healthcare decisions for you. And then what the repercussions are if you say, okay, I want to limit situations here or there, which we'll get into. Um, but it's really, it's this, it's initial here if you want limitations on artificial nutrition, initial here if there's concern about your health care, and we explore all that in the A to J. So there's a couple clarification questions, obviously. Do you want to allow someone else to make your health care decision, which is very weird. And this kicks in when you're unable to make health care decisions, when you're not of sound mind. And explaining that to someone, it's not necessarily I go in and I'm unconscious, but it's more like a doctor makes a determination that I'm comatose or I've suffered a mental break where I'm no longer able to care for myself. And medical decisions are going to have to be made, and if we don't make them, um, right away, and if you haven't assigned someone to make them for you right away, it's either going to be a doctor making for them who has to follow statutory guidelines and act in your best interest, but not necessarily in your own interest, um, which may differ, and which is why you want to fill this out. And another question is if you're a sound mind, you can only fill this form out if you're currently able to receive health care and make decisions for yourself. And that's really what it is. It's sound mind is a, it became really a, um, an important, it's an important thing, and you'll see it again with the actual person making the determinations, but it's an important thing with just to make sure the form is executed correctly, but at the same time, if you're able to fill it out, if you're able to make your own health care decisions, we're, they're going to be found here of sound mind. So I've chosen for myself that I want my mother to make health care decisions for me. So, but if you're not sure who we pick, the typical advice is pick someone that's familiar with your medical history and really uh, familiar with your social history, religious, anything that might put its way into the way you receive health care. So it asks, uh, there's three qualifying questions. The health care power of attorney, the person that's going to make the decision, has to be over 18. They have to be of sound mind themselves. And they can't be one of your doctors. And there's just an inherent conflict of interest um, that if you're paying them for health care, 
that the state wanted to avoid. So written into the statute is that the person can't be one of your health care providers that you're paying right now. I did find to show you an example, but if you say if they don't meet one of the qualifications, the A to J will, will tell you why and will either allow you to choose another agent, go back to where you were if you made the wrong decision. And uh, and then for you know if it's not if it's not going to work for you, you can exit out of the interview. So then they collect, the AHA collects some qualifying information on how to get in touch with this person should you become incapacitated. And originally, and actually I pulled out a, a, an old form, there was a question you can put in your home phone, your work phone, and your cell phone. And one of the technical questions that we came is, what if you have a home phone and not a work phone? We want to collect one piece of evidence, or one piece, uh, one phone number. Um, but what if you don't have a work phone? What if you don't have a home phone, but you have one of the other ones? And the way that the AHA was working after I worked, it wasn't, we couldn't create a variable to properly uh, account for one being filled out, but not all three. So in a newer form, we actually said, okay, what's a primary phone number, and then do you have any secondary phone numbers? The thinking behind it is, the form lists itself as home phone, work phone, cell phone. If you put the primary phone number in the home phone number, it's always going to work, and most people now use a cell phone as a home phone, so it just, it's, it's more contact. The, the name or you know, the label on it isn't as important as actually getting it people. We want to have as many ways to get in touch with someone quickly as possible. So then it asks different forms. Now, generally when I was talking to legal aid, they said that you want to make this as le the least restrictive as possible. You're assigning someone to make healthcare decisions for you, therefore you think that they're going to make things that are in your interest. Um, so if you start putting in all these different uh, qualifications and things like that, that you're not really sure about or they start to conflict, the form is going to lose its purpose. Um, so, that being said, typically you would say, okay, you know, broad form and quickly, the way that the quickest, quickest way to do it is just to say, okay, they can make all decisions for me. Uh, we'll go through it as an example, you'll show there's some, if you wanted to make limitations. So the first question they asked is about a feeding tube. I'll say she has that authority, but I want to make some limitations. And for this, I want to be in a coma for at least a year before a feeding tube is removed. That gets entered into the form. The same thing with artificial hydration, which is just a, a water tube um, as opposed to a feeding tube. It's just, I mean, they, they separate it. It really works the same way, um, and it's going to work the same way, but it's separated out for statutory form and in statute, so we separate it out as well. Um, so I put the same restriction in there. Now there's a question if should you make all of your mental health decisions? And this becomes, there's a few listed into the form. You're talking about things like um, I mean, electroconvulsive therapy and things like that. Um, and that's going to be the restriction that we put in here. There's also, I mean, anything that you can think of. And there's people that just have different, different worries that they have um, that they don't necessarily think that a person's going to make on their behalf, they can put down in the form. And there's also, in North Carolina, they specifically ask you, because there's other forms that deal with mental health and they don't want them to contradict, they ask you to fill something else out. So I say no. If you have the last year, the, the formal last year to attach it, and you can just file it there. And if, so long as they're consistent, it's fine. Um, it asks about autopsy, and I have no problems. And I want to donate all of my organs except for my brain. My body can be donated for medical study, and she can make any other general health care. We'll go to that. Learn more. In general, we're talking about requesting and reviewing medical records, privacy things, x-rays, other tests, the general things. And that's what's good about the A to J, is that when there's questions like that, as opposed to when you're seeing it in the form, it's just text, and it gets very tedious to look through. Um, this, it, it directs you, it's you know, pull all of the questions. You know, it, it's helpful for everyone. So, I say my mother can make all these decisions for me. and you have to be of sound mind right now. Now, the question, another question that Legal Aid said, um, if you want, there's an ability to include a doctor, and they would, they'll make the doctor make those decisions for you. Um, Legal Aid has said that it's very, it doesn't work well in the form. Um, we allow people to make it because it's in the statute, but when you put, when you allow, when you put a doctor's name in there, sometimes if it's a life-threatening situation and they're having to call up a doctor, it's outside hours, they can't get a hold of them, everything's held up because of that. So we make that clear to the person. Um, 
we say that you know you don't have to choose a doctor if it's an emergency you're going to have competent doctors there if there's someone that you really really want to um, go ahead and put it in the form and we'll accept it but if you don't choose a doctor here's the repercussions we kind of we were afraid of straddling the line between um, you know giving legal advice and just giving and um, just stating what the form says so I think that it's not necessarily pushing someone to it although that was kind of the intent it's more like it explaining fully and saying, okay, here are the repercussions because the form doesn't really say that. <clears throat> so I decide that I don't want to talk about, or I don't want to add a doctor. So we're almost finished. Now, to fill out the form, you need two witnesses and need a notary. So the last couple questions are just going to explain the process. You're going to print it out. You're going to find two witnesses that aren't related to you. You're going to find a notary. And the way that the form is, you initial where your restrictions are. So the form is set up that it's going to direct you where to initial. <clears throat> it kicks you out to... Okay. So here's our form with everything filled out. We have our telephone numbers, our way to get in contact. Our physician is left blank. And explaining here, if it's left blank, the, the attending physician will make decisions um, based on what the healthcare power attorney says. Now here are the initial blocks, and to set it up, we have these that toggle on and off. So I do have some limitations on artificial nutrition and hydration, um, and I have some about healthcare decisions, and they're going to be added into a supplemental form below, because obviously you can see the space that they allow is only about one sentence long, and when you start to get into it, it's just not practical. Um, where there's not, I had no, nothing about, or I had no advanced uh, mental health treatment forms, so this doesn't come up as initial here. Same with the autopsy remains and remains. And uh, my organ donation, it tells me that I want the brain. Um, and the supplemental form down here, now all of this is going to end up blank because it's the notary that has to come in, seal it, sign it with you. And um, we didn't think that that was necessarily a problem with the pro se litigant. Uh, they're going to have the notary there. And it's literally, I mean, here's the witness. It's the witness name, witness signature. It's not necessarily someone that you're going to know right away. And they're going to be there. They can sign their name, they're dated and the notary is going to have to stamp it anyway and sign the county. The supplemental form populates below, and it's based on section. Now, when there's no limitation, instead of just having it blank, because there, was, there wasn't a way in the form to bump everything up and make it look nice, so we held out the, uh, all the sections. And what's important about the form is just you make sure that you're clear. So the problem with the supplemental form being this way, if you just left it blank, there might be a problem if they initial the wrong place or there's something else. If you initial as a limitation but you don't list anything, the form allows it to say, okay, it's, it's fully or it's fully restricted. So if there was a question down here and it becomes like, okay, there's limitations, but the form is designed right, the way that we set it up addresses those. And it just says, here's my limitations concerning autopsy, and inside it, there's no limitations. And here are, and if it if there was something in the top, like artificial nutrition or artificial hydration, that there was no limits, but there were limits below it. It doesn't look like it kind of just like starts in the middle. It doesn't make sense. Nope, that's the entire form. And uh, if you guys have any questions, right So given the, this might just be a complex question, but um, in terms of the limitations, other than anticipating, you know, certain things that could be true, does your A to J provide like uh, a list in there of possible things? Like, because if you're a person and, you know, like, I don't want my body, I don't want to be taken off this feeding tube for a year, or I don't want this part of my body dissected, or if you are not familiar with kind of the, the things that happen at, you know, after you get into this kind of a, a condition, is there anything in your A2J that provides kind of like that anticipates, like, these are some of the things you should consider, or? Well, the form itself is free form, okay. so anything you have, and I think the feeling is more that we want to leave it as open as possible okay. to the person that's making the decisions, and that way you, you focus more on who you're choosing and making sure they're more in line with you. Um, if you have a specific problem with something, it's going to be at the forefront of your mind. So you're filling this out. And this is, I mean, honestly, the end user, this is probably going to be, it affects the aging, the elderly. Um, necessary, not necessarily everyone is going to fill this out. It's people that kind of anticipate health problems and have been going through this. So if there's an issue that comes up, we didn't want to direct them to start restricting all of these things, where that might be in another form. And that's another uh, thing, too. There's, this is the healthcare power of attorney, which grants rights to another person mm -hmm. to make on your behalf, to make decisions on your behalf. There's also an advanced directive form, okay. which kind of fits in more with that kind of stuff. Um, 
And when if you're thinking about like certain things, like I don't want to take this drug, or you know, I'm going under, I'm going under. Like um, these are the, the things that I do want to happen to me, or don't want to happen to me. Um, that's more the realm of the advanced record. So does your initial here print out on the form? Yes. When you print it, it's kind of in the side there. Are there any problems with that? With by with keeping it, or that should be fine? I haven't seen any problems. Um, when I printed it, it seems like it fits in the margins. Um, and the first, the, the initial problem that it has is just that you couldn't get the whole thing to populate. Um, and for a while I wanted, but it wasn't, it was just, the form was too small. But the way that the form is, and the way that to direct someone, it's just kind of, it's funny. Um, you don't want to put their initials in for them um, because of the sensitivity of the form. So you kind of just want to push them. It's like, okay, and then just, you know, almost, Baby steps, like go down the form, sign here, sign here, sign here. But there haven't been any issues with it. Okay. Thank you.